make this all possible. And so basically um, what you're seeing here is basically the um, home where I'm um, in the Midwest in Columbus, Ohio on a small urban property. And this is the backyard photo um, that started off as all turf grass. And, you know, a lot of gardening advice usually says to start small, but Stephen and I turned the grass um, into a permaculture edible food forest and wildlife habitat. Um, this was three years later in this photo. Um, the garden is now six years old and it's quite dynamic as it keeps changing every year. And as you can see, it's not really a typical garden with neat rows, but I love being in nature as um, Lauren was mentioning, so I wanted to bring more of it to where I live. And so it's now a certified wildlife habitat with the National Wildlife Federation, which means it provides food and water and shelter and places to raise young as well as using sustainable practices. And so it has replenishing resources for wildlife such as bees and butterflies and a lot more birds now, as well as other flies and insects, spiders, caterpillars, and um, basically supports um, local wildlife along as well as the migratory corridors. Um, and so it's also a monarch uh, way station and you know 90% of all the milkweed or monarch habitats occur within the agricultural landscape, but conventional farming practices have adopted practices of growing uh, GMO or herbicide resistant corn and soybeans, which has resulted in the loss of more than 100 million acres of monarch habitat in recent years. And so, you know, Roundup or glyphosate herbicide is used to control these weeds. Uh, and this is where, you know, monarchs use for their summer breeding area. And since Ohio has, you know, 60% of land in conventional farming production, um, even on our own properties, I think it can make a difference. So I'm doing here whatever little I can because, uh, you know, the uh, US government uh, article had said that we need an estimated 1.8 billion more milkweed plants to be able to enable the dwindling Eastern monarch butterfly population to bounce back. And so here you'll see just a few of the um, milkweeds that are native to here. You wanna make sure um, that they're native. And you know I think anything increasing the number will really help. Um, but a truly effective monarch waste station will be at least 100 square feet. And um, to maximize the use of your habitat, it's recommended you have at least 10 milkweed plants made up of two or more species. And that way, you know, it can, um, they'll be blooming at different times and can provide a little more resource for them along the season in case they're running late or a little early. And then um, that being said, I think anything will help at this point. So um, these are just the different ones that I have here in my yard. Um, the property is also a native bee sanctuary, and we have around 500 or so native or wild bee species here in Ohio that does not include the non-native honeybee. And we've planted quite a few native plants that are indigenous to Ohio that are host plants or support um, the pollen and nectar sources for native wildlife that he's a, has evolved with them. And most of the native bees are teeny tiny and can fly only you know, 100 or 300 feet of their nesting sites. So even though we have a lot of native plants, we also leave things like open or unmulched ground because 70% of those native bees are ground nesters and we leave old stems up for the other 30% who are cavity nesting bees. Um, and so basically I think, you know, bumblebees are often considered an indicator of health of the diversity of an environment. And we have five of the 11 different species of bumblebees that are native to Ohio as well as the other leaf cutters, mason bees, and more. And so these two on the Gallardia or the blanket flower are actually two male bees out for a drink. Um, um, and the Melisodes longhorned bee on the left and a brown belted male bumblebee on the right. And so this year, especially, I've noticed, you know, more families of birds come in. I don't know any of the birds, but they're making nesting sites here this year because we have enough insects, caterpillars, and bugs as food to, for them. Um, you know, Doug Tellamy talks about having, um, you know, needing 1,200 caterpillars to feed a little clutch of chickadees. And so I'm pretty excited that we have, you know, by increasing the diversity that uh, we've been able to um, bring them in. And in the birds have actually become a huge part of my organic pest management as we had pest problems in the garden initially in the 
first and second or third year, but we haven't had much problem the last couple of years as the birds have taken care of them. And also, oh yes, um, because the garden basically provided my food for that first year during COVID. So I only had to go grocery shopping for four times that year. Um, and so I was very grateful to have that. And today's presentation might be a little different from what you're used to. As part of the Master Gardener Volunteer Programs, we provide research-based garden information. However, permaculture or sustainable gardening or restorative or regenerative agriculture, as it may also be called, does not yet have a lot of research-based studies on it per se, although many of the individual components I'll be talking about do have a research basis. But in saying that, much of the original permaculture information has been based on hundreds of years of traditional practices of our Indigenous peoples who live with and honoured um, and we're much more in touch with the land, um, developing these intimate dynamic relationships that could shift and adapt depending on the situation. And so much of their information has not been recorded in ways that we're used to now, but it was you know, passed on from person to person and integrated with the life of a community. And so much of that information you know, is being lost when we took them off their land and um, onto the reserves and things too. And so, Permaculture or the sustainable gardening, um, you know, are really the techniques to me that I think, um, you know, because the Indigenous peoples have developed and evolved them for hundreds of years, it hasn't been really with that acknowledgement. And I think we've been treating it as if we're discovering these new ways of growing. So I just wanted to sort of acknowledge that part of it because they know how to manage nature's resources. And I think it's important to recognize it. So, you know, I'm. I'm just learning about the indigenous peoples in the Prescott area. Um, you know, the Natives Land Link Above is a nonprofit dedicated to creating spaces where non-indigenous people can be invited to challenge and um, or challenge to learn about the lands that they inhabit, the history of those lands, and how they actively uh, can be a part of um, a, um, of that together um, going forward. And so you have the people of the sun there. You're, you have a Pi Prescott tribe. Um, they're often divided into four geological bands. And so, um, you know, who've identified as separate or independent peoples, um, the um, Dolkabaya in Western Yavapai, the Yavbe of the Northern, Northwestern Yavapai. Um, you also have some in the South, Southeast and the Northeast or Verde Valley. And so, you know, from what I understand, they were mainly hunter gatherers following an annual round migrating to different areas to follow the ripening of different edible plants and the movement of game. And it was the Dokabaya in the West that turned to agriculture more than the other Yavapai. And so in keeping with the more traditional ways of passing down information and to respect the wisdom of the indigenous ways as it relates to permaculture and the origins of that, it's from this perspective that I'll be offering this information as much of it came from my direct observations on my own property and making those adaptations based on what I saw and through experimentation and experience. But I will be blending it with some current, you know, research-based information and tools or technology that hopefully you might find Useful if you're considering incorporating sort of perma permaculture practices in your yard. And so much of this presentation will be a story, basically my personal story about the how the Sunny Glen Garden edible permaculture food forest evolved, um, which is based a lot on some personal life choices I made as much of what came um, from wanting to reduce my waste and avoiding pollution, um, basically to leave the smallest imprint possible on the planet. And I would like to present it this way because, oops, what I chose basically, um, you know, I didn't realize was uh, part, of, you know, part of permaculture, um, but I think it does highlight the basic premises and ethics of the permaculture very well when you see how these principles are applied in real life. And so this was my first garden back in 2015. I truly didn't know what I was doing because I had never gardened before, but I was um, lucky to link up with some people who did. And so these tiny plants were part of a perennial edible food forest that came bare root, which means without soil. I didn't really know how or where to plant them. So 
just stuck them in the ground, but it really high, highlights how little I knew as I planted what would grow to be big trees or bushes that would block the only remaining sun I had left in the yard where I was planning to grow a vegetable garden. So, um, but just to make note here before I pass to the next slide, um, you might be able to tell the slope of the land here that has a slightly higher elevation on the right side, sloping down to the left side with the open parking lot behind it and the trunk of the huge oak tree on the left side of this photo. We'll be talking about how that impacts some of this land here. And so the basic principles of permaculture are pretty simple, creating systems that take care of people, the earth, and distribute the surplus well. And so there are many different definitions and principles depending on who you talk to. You know, Bill Mollison um, states that the only ethical you know, decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. I'd like to add that I would like that to be for future generations of their children. Um, but in these times, you know, I think that you know, things are happening in the world that can be addressed in many ways, and I don't have control over many of these outside situations. So I strive to do my best to take care of my own needs, given my life situation and what it is that I do have control over. And this doesn't mean I necessarily live in isolation or to be self-reliant, but rather just to do my best and make the best and highest use of the resources available to me. Um, my yoga teacher, Sagru, has a quote that, you know, if you don't do what you cannot do, it's all right. But if you don't do what you can do, that's a tragedy. And so basically, I don't want to become a tragedy. So I've just seen what can I do, um, you know, in these little directions that I can. And what I found is when we care for ourselves and act responsible as responsible consumers, life becomes much more abundant. I now have access to an abundant supply of healthy, organic, fresh, homegrown food. Um, which is financially more resilient, you know, be, especially because with loss of all my income sources during COVID, you know, um, the garden supplied most of those food needs. And so caring for my own existence on the land um, that I have access to is providing that abundance, which can now be reinvested into the community through sharing of food and seeds and knowledge or other skills and assistance and just create that um, abundance for everybody involved. And so I don't want you to worry about this list, but when you know I'm researching permaculture, these are some of the main permaculture principles that you'll often see related to it. And I don't know about you, um, these principles might sound fine and dandy listed as you know, using small scale intensive systems, you know, having components that perform multiple functions, um, you know, but um, so. I don't think I really would have an idea of what to actually do for most of these. So I'm hoping that providing examples of what has been done in the backyard of the Sunny Glen Garden and in my life, it will shed some light on what these might mean in terms of what can actually be done. And so permaculture is much more than gardening. It is more a lifestyle or way of living. So you can also take many of these ideas into gardening or into other areas um, of your life. And so telling my my story, um, I hope well, you can see how permaculture is dynamic and a um, continuous evolution. Um, but gardening came about for me in a roundabout way. I had some issues come up with diabetic indicators and precancerous polyps, high blood pressure, basically following all the lines of my family who you know, have died from heart attacks or cancer. And as Japanese Canadians, just like the Japanese Americans, they were interned during the Second World War as they were considered a threat to national security. And so their livelihood or their fishing boats and properties were confiscated and sold by the government and proceeds were used to pay for their internment. My grandmother didn't want the family to be separated by gender, which would happen if they went to the camp. So they decided to um, move further inland where they were no longer considered a threat on the coast. And um, you know, many people like my parents then ended up as farm laborers and lived on, you know, my dad remembers living in an empty grain elevator on a farmer's field as that uh, was a place that he allowed them to stay. And so they ended up hoeing sugar beets. Um, you know, protective gear was not emphasized. They were spraying chemicals directly on food crops and exposed to the chemicals. Um, and none of these things were ever talked about in my family. So I never knew any of these things happened until I started growing food in my own backyard. And these things sort of came up in conversation with my mom. Um, but for me, I wanted to see if there are things I could do to mitigate the health issues I had coming up. So I started doing some Isha yoga and meditation. 
Um, and because I had this daily practice, it was easier to see differences when some days my body would feel great and things went smoothly and easily. And other days I would feel so stiff and sore or my joints would ache or I'd be irritable and grumpy. So all I did was look at the food um, at what, and how I felt after eating it. You know, meats were definitely making me more lethargic and sleepy. My muscles were tighter and sore. I grew up on garlic and onions, which I know have medicinal qualities, but I, um, you know, I would feel irritated or it would upset my stomach. You know, coffee made me feel jittery and hyper and some dyes and preservatives were starting to make me itchy or gave me rash. And so basically I really started shifting um, my diet. They were basically everything my yoga instructor told me, but um, or recommended to me for optimal health and facilitate the meditation. But I guess I had to experience it myself. And so the things that I could eat that made my body feel great was more fresh food, especially greens. And so for me, it became more of a choice. Do I want to cater to the taste buds or facilitate ease and health in my body? And sometimes it's still both. But what I found is that my taste buds have shifted over time and what I used to crave and love, I no longer really like. And so I'm finding the most joy eating fresh anything from the garden. Um, the processed food has a lot less of the life energy or freshness to it and often comes with those ingredients. So I no longer want to put them in my body and the thickeners or preservatives or dyes as well that come, you know, they come in plastic packages. And so all of that um, was, e you know, easily uh, easier to remit, uh, eliminate if I wasn't um, buying them anymore. And so while wanting to eliminate the pesticides and preservatives in food, I learned more about organic gardening or how they have food has more nutrients than conventionally grown. And some of the research here down on the left side of the chart are vegetables grown organically in the first row and commercially in the second row. And across the top of the chart are nutrients and minerals found in organic vegetables versus the commercially grown ones. And so basically, you know, organic would be more bang for my buck to <laughs> buy organic. Um, and so sometimes they would say the cost of organic produce may be a bargain when you consider the increased mineral content over conventionally grown produce. You know, our traditional farming methods um, are often subsidized, um, which is, makes it cheaper and produce a lot of food, but these monocultural ways you know, often depletes the soils and kills the mycorrhizome layer in the soil or the chemicals, you know, used to handle the pests often kill more than just the specific pests. And so, you know, I'm wanting to see if I could grow in ways then that were a little more um, organic and in keeping with uh, what I wanted to see happen here, at least on my little property. And so as you can see, conventional methods are usually about killing something off, and so they might be effective, um, but organic in general keeps things alive and living. Um, the organic uh, practices continually replenish the soil without having to use these chemicals. And so, you know, but organic food is a lot more expensive. It's not subsidized like the conventional um, produce that we have. It reflects more the real cost of growing food. Um, so growing food in my own yard seemed like a way to provide some of those, um, some of that food as seeds were much cheaper than the produce. And so I've been able to grow 100% um, organically so far for um, the past six years. It takes a little more observation and knowing the life cycle of your pests, but having more balanced ecosystems, it also starts to become less and less of an issue as plants are healthier. They're not as susceptible to disease and pests. And um, I feel like, you know, the um, as I take care of the soil, more like nature does it, uh, things, all good things sort of happen in the garden. And if you don't go, grow your own food, I'd like to recommend, you know, perhaps going to your local farmer's market, getting to know who's growing your food and how they're growing it. You'll be supporting local economy, reducing the transportation pollution costs that go from having food shipped. And so, you know, the food on on your plate, they say on average travels 1500 miles from farm to your table. And so growing it in the garden, I just get to step outside my door. Um, and also, you know, if you do sort of weekly um, buying, um, you know, less food is wasted. I'll be talking about that a little more. Uh, but, you know, it's so great to have all this variety from all over the world, but I'm really wanting to support a way of growing food that isn't killing our environment. And so buying organic is a way to um, support that too. I'm, I'm Canadian on a green card, so I don't have that one vote, but I can vote with every purchase I make um, and, the, and the choices that I, I do. And 
I think also I think there's just a lot of power that can be given to people when they do this um, together. And we can, you know, have these larger corporations that have more interest in just their profits and, and tell them by our numbers that, um, you know, we want something different. Um, this is just something, you know, it made me wonder like, why are there so many chemicals in the food that we buy and how, you know, when did this come okay and why, and, you know, are they necessary? Do we have to accept this? What are my options? Um, this is just somebody who does a lot of research-based um, information. Um, she's sort of a, an author or activist or um, affiliate marketer who criticizes the food in, um, industry. And she's caught a lot of flack from the large corporations because she's been starting to expose their ingredients and products they were selling, you know, some of the chemicals and foods that were directed at children that, you know, have been known carcinogens, differences in ingredients for the same product sold in the US than in Europe where they have stricter laws, um, you know, where they, some of their chemicals and preservatives can't be used. And so when I was doing my own research on companies and who I wanted to support with um, how they were doing things, she was sort of my trusted go-to source of information. And so you can just <laughs> Google food babe and the food item. And so, you know, if you're not growing it organically or can't buy organically, at least you can be given some ideas of companies who are actively working in directions um, that uh, are, are looking towards health of the planet as well. Um, and, you know, make better choices in that way. But she has quite a large following. They call it the Food Babe Army. And so a lot of times she's getting a lot of things happening because so many people are taking part. Uh, and then, you know, Stephen has often been uh, curious about my experiments. I think it's like a little adventure trying them out. I like trying to grow my own healthy products in the garden that I use all the time, even though they might not necessarily be, um, you know, part of this environment here. For example, the ginger on the left and the turmeric on the bottom right are tropical plants, but I started them in the basement early and plant them in the garden once the soil temperatures are over 68-ish, I guess. And I haven't had to do anything um, for them afterwards. They need hot and humid uh, and they can handle some shade. So it does fit in well with my forest garden. Um, but man, that fresh ginger, the, the pink and creamy stuff that you see it's amazingly intense and beautifully pungent much different tasting than the you know mother ginger root or older ginger root like at the bottom of that picture there that's tan colored um, that we get in the stores where the outer skin has dried um, and so you need to be careful so that you're not introducing pests or diseases into your garden so it's best to purchase from companies where you know they test for things like you know with your seed potatoes etc but i was not able to purchase ginger starters so i started mine from organic ginger root from the international store here and so now i just save some to eat i get some stored as they dry and the best ones i grow out for next year and the top one is crocus um, sativa or saffron. It's one of the priciest foods around at $1,500 per pound. I mean, I don't need that much, nor could I grow that much as these, each of those flowers produces three tiny filaments of saffron, um, but it's a health spice that I use. And so growing it makes it more affordable. And once I learned how to prevent the squirrels from digging those bulbs up. And then turmeric is something I use all the time as well with its natural, you know, um, antibiotic properties and um, you know it takes a while for some of these rhizomes to to form underground but there's no packaging they don't, the only transportation involved is me walking to harvest it from the garden and those you know since I started doing some planting indoors I added some microgreens and lettuces because they were highly nutritious um, they were also you know, more expensive in the store. And so I found them easy to grow in myself. And so these are a lot of the dishes I had in the winter with the microgreens I grew indoors, sunflowers and pea shoots, um, lettuces went on almost everything with soups and salads and other dishes. And again, eliminated buying or supporting the plastic packaging that's non-recyclable um, and that they came in. And so uh, often I could also get a second or third flush after harvesting the microgreens and then I would feed the root mass to the worms and my vermicomposted down in the basement um, or in the composter outside. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to see what we can to do reduce plastic waste. I mean, I, 
you know, maybe with COVID and not being in the store that often, it really struck me just walking down the grocery aisles and really looking at it, because you know, seeing all these endless packaging of boxes, foods in plastic, plastic wrap, plastic containers, and it's like, like when did this become okay? And is all this packaging necessary? What are you know my options? I mean, even in the health food sections, you know, they still come in packaging that goes to the landfill after use. So I wanted to see how much I could eliminate by growing it myself or make better choices on the products I did purchase. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is what the neighbor across the street puts out every week. I mean, the average American, they say, produces 1,600 pounds of trash every year. And currently, when I'm living by myself, I've been able to reduce that trash to put out one little you know, plastic grocery size bag that goes into the landfill, maybe once every three to four months, or I would say about an average then based on these figures of one pound per year compared to the average American that produces about 1600 pounds of trash every year. And so I roll my garbage bin to the street only three to four times a year instead of every week. I can do this because there's no like um, rotting food in the garbage, it's all dry waste. And so it can sit around and it also saves me me time saves our landfill from filling up as the stuff has to go somewhere. And so to me preventing, you know, 1,599 pounds of garbage going into the landfill each year for one person, what one person can do is significant. And I'm hoping this will maybe just inspire you to take this on too, as when more people do this, the bigger impact we can have. And one thing I would highly encourage you to do, maybe after this presentation, to bring insight into how much waste you produce is when you go home, pull out your garbage can and take a photo inventory of what is in there. And just, you know, can you make one different choice for an item that will be more environmentally friendly? It really makes me think about every choice I, I make and, and the impact that it can have. Um, and this photo was taken actually from the top of our Franklin County landfill um, because I couldn't find one for a photo in Prescott. And so this is the view from the suckest highest point in Franklin County because it's um, made by us from all the garbage we produce here, um, which is 1.1 uh, million tons of garbage for Franklin County in Columbus, Ohio. And this height is actually limited by the regulations. So they have to create another pit and line it before putting in our, our trash um, in a separate area. And it was pretty sobering and fascinating to look out of the windows of a tour bus um, of the landfill as I watched these huge trucks, you know, 20 to 30 of them per day, loaded with 20 tons each to unload this mountain of garbage we create here in Columbus. And I did check, um, they do offer tours of the Prescott transfer. I find it interesting, they call them transfer stations. You know, it's like we're trying to avoid that we create trash. Um, but you can contact Brady here at his email above. And I'd recommend seeing it as it's just, I think, has a different impact seeing it and watching that garbage heap being made than what any kind of statistics I can tell you alone will do. You know, a lot of the fees collected at your, your county rural transfer stations cover only 60% of your cost of the services. And so basically $600,000 of your property tax revenues are used to pay the remaining 40%. And if you live within those incorporated areas and communities that provide curbside pickup, um, I think you know you're paying 100% of your trash disposals. But 60, you know, I, I was told on average 76% of that waste is not have to be filling up the precious and limited space we have in the landfill. And food waste is the number one on that list. So, and we're not just talking food scraps. They calculate that the average person spends about $1,500 on food per year that they allow to go to waste so it's never eaten. And yet in my county, in Franklin County, there are residents we have who go hungry without three to four meals per week. And so we can change this by growing vegetable gardens and edible food for us in our yards to share and you know, making use of any of this wasted food for free fertilizer, which can bring more nutrients into the food we grow, creating that sort of um, you know, closed cycle loop. Um, and so this is, again, some of the information I'm hoping to provide. Um, but you know, much of the landfill waste is also recoverable or recyclable. And so you know, I went to our Swaco, um, we need buyers who will buy these materials on the other end of it. And, um, you know, but it's a lot of that is um, it, it's a lot of these products are not 
you know, we're not able to recycle and, uh, or so many of these processes require many more toxins or energy to convert them into something usable. And so, you know, it's so disheartening to know how little is recyclable, you know, the lettuces or, you know, berries that I used to buy that come in these clamshells are not recyclable. And so, of course, it's really nice to be able to grow them in the garden so I don't have to be contributing to that. Um, um, we're about yes. halfway through. So yes. it would be really good if we could get into a little bit on the garden side, um, if we could. Yep. Love yes. To see your garden and what you're doing in the permaculture world. Yes. Well, a lot of the things I'm talking about, the recyclables have direct bearing because all of the things that I am recycling now are going in my garb garbage. But I did want to provide sort of the background of that information on the importance of it and the impact that it can have when we do that in our own yards. Certainly. I was and, just looking at time. That's all. I'll yes. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for helping <laughs> keep me on track. And so basically, um, you know, Yavapai does have, you know, things that you can recycle or not. And I would highly recommend that you pay attention to that. A lot of their things, you know, get stuck by people putting things in that don't belong. They have to close systems down and things like that. So, um, and then one of the best ways to reduce or eliminate plastic packaging um, is looking in that garbage. And so I was making my own snacks because I offer coconuts, which come in its own packaging using peelers to dehydrate them. Stephen and I grew our own popcorn in the garden, heirlooms. And so um, we can add a lot of the um, herbs also that are in there. I can't grow um, almonds here, but I can buy them in bulk and we make our own crack um, crackers from leftover pulp, um, making our own almond milk, um, and then, you know, other things that can happen through here. And so, you know, even considering the purchases I make, you know, the secondhand, you know, um, clothes dryer on the top left is foldable. It's the latest and greatest in solar and wind technology when it's outside. Um, but the top right photo, it's also great for drying my popcorn cobs and the rice after harvesting. Uh, the, and then basically the, um, you know, on the bottom two photos, the drying, um, I make my own handmade papers by shredding up the junk mail and envelopes that come to my mailbox and the things that cannot be composted into the yard. And so these papers are now being used for my business card cards because my printer works on it. And I find it oddly satisfying to promote my business on the junk mail of other companies. You know, just making gifts from the gardens with seeds and things like that, that can come out. So I'm not having to purchase and contribute to a lot of these um, items that we purchased for each other. And one of the biggest choices I made was giving up a car. Um, I didn't wanna be spewing off emissions, didn't wanna support the gas industry. Um, you know, I'm working on the computer at home. I needed more exercise and wondered, could I really do this? Cause many people do. And so I just thought, well, it'd be great if I had a bicycle. And when I went to a garden club meeting, they raffled off this mountain bike. And so I couldn't believe I won it and I had no more excuses. So this, bicycle became you know the best everything for the garden this year um, and I also had no car payments or car insurance not having to buy gases I did a lot more carpooling and I have a friend who lives nearby who let me borrow her car for big trips or when I had to go out of town for classes and things and so it's just a way of living in the community which again I wanted to share some of that because permaculture again is not just about gardening um, but it you know, I, I do want to, as we were saying, you know, I, all my health issues have resolved. And so everything's, you know, feeling pretty strong and living more simply. So here's where we get to the gardening part of the permaculture. You know, we have 63,000 square miles of turf grass in the USA, and it's the single most irrigated crop in America, more than corn or wheat or food orchards combined. And to keep that grass alive, um, residents put 50 to 75% of their total water consumption um, watering it and spend $36 billion on lawn care to put you know, millions of pounds of chemical fertilizers and pesticides on the lawn. Um, and you know, and yet, you know, two of those chemicals are commonly purchased by homeowners at at um, our nursery stores were found to have, um, those chemicals were found to be the highest amounts of unwanted chemicals in the pollen of honeybees. 
Uh, and so I usually leave my lawn growing a little high. I know there's benefits of lawn, but just like, why can't we take, you know, these 63,000 square miles of turf and turn it into food? I know you might not have as much grass out in Prescott as we do here, um, but as this might demonstrate, you know, the mowers are blowing in my neighborhood all this week. All three of them are out today. The one on the right using his riding mower, the one on the left using his gas mower, one down the street using his trimmer is not even using it yet. And, you know, these, we have those decibels are very high, which are considered, you know, typical gas powered motors emit 95 to 100 decibels. Uh, um, and every time you shout and need to be heard, someone greater than standing greater than three feet away, that noise level is considered, um, considered potentially um, hazardous to health. And so, um, you know, they also pollute the air, um, but if there are 54 million Americans mow their lawns and use 800 million gallons of gas to do that, um, they even spill 17 million gallons of gas that is estimated just to fill up the lawn mowers. And that's kind of more than all the oil spilled in the Exxon Valdez um, in the Gulf of Alaska. And a lot of these were not regulated, our garden equipment. And so a lot of um, nitrogen oxides and those other volatile organic compounds were often spewed from there. And so I'd often, you know, like to, you know, my solution came from a donation from a friend who purchased a badly battery powered mower and gave me her bright blue hand push mower. So it's easy to use. Stevie helps me like sharpen the mowers once a year and it has that blessed quietness. I guess this would be my version of a tractor mower um, or maybe a herd of goats. Um, and also just this idea too, when I helped a couple of friends move, they were surprised at how strong I was for a shorty. I don't work out, but I think being outside in the garden, carting around the mulch and soil, um, you know, or using these simple tools have been one of the best ways for me to see fit. And so um, it's better for the environment. Um, and so I'd encourage you to kind of reconsider your garden tools and toys and do some hand trimming or get out the shovel to do some edging. Uh, so this is an overview of the property land where I live in Columbus, Ohio. It's located, um, um, you know, it's important to understand some of the basics about where you would like to garden as it can make a big difference on the choice of plants you put there uh, as they need to have an environment that suits them, especially for perennials or plants that will be there for the long term. And now in saying this, you know, as you know, I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning and didn't know any of this or do any of this, but I got lucky as I observed a lot of things and, and hooked in with people who did know more. And so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it's best to do so if you can, but um, you know, I wouldn't worry about it so much because you can dig up and transfer plants to areas more suited or um, share them with people. Um, but I'll use my property here as an example of things that um, you might want to consider if you're starting a kind of garden. This property is about 40 feet wide by 150 feet long. And this little blue square triangle is my 860 square foot home. And so it's best if you have a year's time to really observe what happens on the area of your ground or property. Um, this is a wintertime view that you get to see of the lay of the land using just Google Maps. But here in the summer, it's a very different story. And this um, you know, yellow circle is the huge 150 or 175 year old pin oak tree in the backyard that shades the entire house and two thirds of my backyard. The orange circle is the you know, silver maple that when it leaves out shades the entire front yard in the summer. This blue line is a line of maple trees from my neighbor's backyard that blocks the south facing line of the sun. Um, and so, and finally, the blue trees of my neighbors in that northwest corner, uh, which is a, also a walnut tree that gives off those juggalones that many plants are sensitive to, so some plants may not grow, grow there. And so that leaves me about four to four and a half hours of direct sun from the west or on the left side um, in that little bitty space that's left outlined in red. And so most vegetable gardens, as you know, um, you know, need a minimum of six to eight hours of sunshine. So my annual vegetables are often couple, a couple weeks behind most other vegetable gardens and maybe are not as prolific, but that's why it's very well suited for the edible perennial food forest and brings a little more of nature to me. Um, and then from here, I, <laughs> I hope you can tell what this is. I haven't ever done art or painting before, but my son left some watercolor pens and I didn't have 
a diagram that I could use um, that I had permission for. And so basically I have these 10 overlapping layers of an edible perennial food forest plants in the backyard um, that can sort of be used like a template of how you might want to arrange things in your garden. And basically it simulates the edge of a forest canopy in nature from the tallest canopy tree to the sub canopy, the shrubs and so on by height essentially, but tweaking it with plants that I would like or integrate with all what I already have growing there. And by copying this forest edge, you know, the plants don't compete for light or with each other. So it can be extremely efficient to grow a lot of perennial food plants in a small amount of space, like on my urban property. And so my house would be on the left and the tree line would shift down to the west since that's the direction of the sun. I have shifted some things so I can have more sun patches in the annual garden, but this is essentially the idea of copying the um, forest edge in my backyard. And I have added a couple other levels that I, I don't often see included in permaculture forest layers, just based on my experience, you know, including the underground or the rhizosphere layer um, with the edible root plants, or you know, I've been growing mushrooms um, and the mycelium because so much of that microbiology below the soil surface is really foundational for the health of an ecosystem. And the climbers and vines is another one, but it can interweave and connect all of the above. And I've also included plants, you know, as I have a water garden that mitigates um, the extra rain, rainwater that overflows um, that prevents the flooding in the garden uh, with that um, through there. And I just love it because it's sustainable and come back every year on its own. Um, they take a lot less care. Whoops, hang on a second through here. And so I basically have, um, you know, these plants, which I'll just briefly go over. And many of the, you know, gardeners, I'm sure are familiar with the Three Sisters Guild or a form of companion planting, which is often used in permaculture. Um, it's a technique that was developed hundreds of years ago in ancient practice from the indigenous um, populations of the Americas and widely recognized as an extremely sustainable and environmental farm um, farming technique. A lot of the Yavapai tribes su supplemented their diet with small scale cultivation by planting blocks of maize, the vining winter squash and pole beans together um, that developed over many generations. And so these three crops complement each other in a number of the ways, you know, be beans being good for the soil health because as legumes, they host the microorganisms in their roots that can take nitrogen and transfer it to the soil for use of the plants. The corn with the upright stalks, which can act as a pole-like structure for the climbing beans. The large leaves of the winter squash shading the soil and depriving the weeds of sunlight while preventing moisture from escaping due to evaporation. And so, um, you know, these provide also provide that important component of a healthy diet with carbohydrates, the beans with protein, the squash is rich in vi um, vitamins. And so these kinds of techniques um, are often used and uh, it you know, creates a lot of genetic diversity uh, also. Um, and just being able to collect the seeds that are grown in our local areas, I think is also very important to do because many of our varieties have kind of disappeared and um, with some of the practices now are their companies you know six main companies who own more of our seed um, seed uh, vegetable seed production um, and so they really limit that what can be grown and they're also um, now uh, there's these utility uh, utility what are they called utility um, Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but they're ta not taxes, utility, um, where they apply for, for exclusive rights on the seeds. So we're, they're allowed to sell them, we're allowed to grow them, but we aren't allowed to seed save or grow um, the seeds. Um, that we produce from their plants. And I don't really like that. So seed saving has been a big component of what I do as well. And so hopefully this chart can give you an idea of the perennial edible plants that I've been incorporating in the backyard, trying to simulate that forest edge with what was growing on here with the oak tree and the food plants I was interested in growing. Um, with the oak tree, you know, sort of a guild then like the Three Sisters Guild of these trees and shrubs um, that I've been working on. And so here we have growing 
growing zone 6A, our average frost date is, I think, similar to Prescott, um, October 11th to 20th, and the average late um, frost is May 1st. And so here it just sort of lists the different plants that I've been growing here um, that come back on their own. Um, and, um, but now that they're you know, almost getting fully established, they're in pretty good production. And so if they're placed well, they can grow well together with a minimum amount of space. Um, and the idea is it can produce the necessary firewood from the pruning, the proteins from nuts, fruits, everything towards self um, sustainability. And now it requires very little care because of it's established and, and um, most of the, my time now just goes into harvesting and processing the food that comes out of it and the occasional pruning. And I can still have my edible annuals, as you'll see in the third column there or the column on the right. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to see if I can go to perennial plants, uh, vegetables too, like the asparagus and artichoke, um, sea kale, um, because they just require no you know, watering and um, they have less pest problems um, and less maintenance. And so it's been absolutely amazing for me to watch, fun watching this evolution uh, as, it, as it grows. And so this, you know, it's more about creating this whole ecosystem um, that, you know, supports wildlife that's essential to their survival, providing food for, you know, people and the wildlife and better for the planet. And so, you know, I was looking at, I know permaculture has been used in the desert and over years can create, um, you know, eco habitats that can produce food, uh, even with annual crops. I'm hoping next time I'm out there, I'd like to visit the Hopi reservation in, um, um, keep, I don't know how to pronounce that, Kikotsimovi, um, which is about 90 miles northeast of Flagstaff. Um, but there's um, Michael, um, Johnson is a 200th generation Hopi farmer and been growing in the semi-arid climate there, growing corn and beans that have been a staple of their people and has so many varieties. You know, his studies at Cornell University said he would need 33 inches of annual rainfall in a year to grow corn because with our current corn hybrids, those roots only go down an inch or two in the soil, but they've evolved varieties of corns that they've planted deep into the soil, like two feet or more where the moisture starts. And so their corn has a super long um, epi epicotyls and so they can handle the extreme drought period and are grown without irrigation. And so again, this is why I think it's important to do our own sa seed saving um, and these utility patents on seeds where companies own them so you, you can't grow them. I'm, you know, just, I, I wanna keep that variety because that diversity, the more diversity we have um, is so much healthier and resilient and you know, it, it can handle those extreme weathers or droughts because something is likely to survive when um, some other plants are not. And these monocrops that we do can easily be wiped out by, by things that happen and take out the whole thing. And so um, these are all reasons. And so I don't know about the plants and things in Arizona, but I went based on native plants that um, are in Prescott that I know I kind of went by a lot of the native people and what they had, you know, um, harvested and grown from or worked with through there. And so, you know, these can be replaced from, from the perennial edibles that I'm providing from Columbus with your native trees and shrubs. And basically, because basically the principles of permaculture will be the same in any given environment. And so, you know, you might be able to see how to incorporate these with what you already have growing. Um, and then, you know, they, uh, they may require the full sun, but in a condensed forest edge, if they're placed properly, you know, they may not be competing for that sun and their shade may actually help reduce some of that excess heat, which you have out there, which can help prevent evaporation and help create that whole little mini ecosystems that might not otherwise survive without assistance on their own. And so these might be the tall canopy plants that you have growing, you know, maybe 40, 80 feet, um, I, you know, that suaro I'll be talking about keystone plants that basically, you know, or, or if you think of those bridges that are made in an arch with a stone in it, if you take out one stone, that whole thing falls apart. And so we have these keystone plants that are like that, my oak tree in my backyard, um, but the su suaro is another keystone plant for your area, providing food and habitat for a lot of wildlife with the honeybees and bats and I think hummingbirds and all, all kinds of um, 
birds or orioles, uh, as well as the nocturnal um, pollinators. And so you, you would need two trees since their flowers are, in, are self incompatible. But they do produce um, fresh red fruits that can be turned into syrups and jams, um, edible seeds that can be ground into meal or eaten raw. Um, but you might need a pole to reach them. Uh, juniper berries, again, um, you'll need the female tree that produces those edible berries and acorns again with, with that. Um, and so if I were you, I would focus on growing fruit trees there because of the excellent climate you have for all of those deciduous fruit crops. I'm so jealous. Um, and they're also not as prickly for harvesting than a lot of the other ones. Um, but they can also produce for, you know, 40 years or maybe 20 to 25 years for peaches and nectarines. Uh, and you can also get, you know, some of these other dwarf um, ones, which might be more suitable to smaller landscapes, um, you know, peaches and nectarines um, that flower early may do better on maybe the north or the east um, facing slopes or north side of a house, you know, where a microclimate might help prevent some of those early frost damages, um, but also being able to set them up so they can receive irrigation from swales on the property. Um, and so these are, you know, the manzanita also has you know, can produce fodder and fuel and those edible berries as well as, you know, um, supporting the wildlife and birds, insects, moss and butterflies. Um, and so these were a few of the other ones that maybe can go in the lower area. I'm curious to know if anyone knows about this Quamish bulb, the Kamasia Quamish. I hadn't heard about it before. Um, so maybe we can see if we can grow it on Stephen's place. <laughs> um, but it needs probably a little more moisture too, but the bulbs are usually dug out after flowering in the summer and you know um, uh, harvested out of the turf and then turf was returned. Um, so they had a very kind of controlled burning was used to maintain that open prairie um, and harvested sort of once every few years, but they do have edible bulbs that can be harvested or roast pitted. Um, and they're said to taste like sweet potatoes or even a little um, sweeter. So, um, and then through here, I won't go through the edible food forest plants in the backyard, but like I said, you know, these, the oak tree, um, you know, it's like, I, it's like having a party in my backyard where it's fenced in and out of view of my neighbor so I can keep it a little more like nature and its wild state as you see here in the video, whereas the front yard for now I keep a little more business like until they get used to my more natural ways and leaving these, you know, leaves on the lawn or raking them in my garden beds I do this basically twice a year. Um, and don't do, you know, rarely do weeding or watering then because of that, um, so it can protect that ground soil, bumblebees have been known to nest in the ground just under the leaves. And then all these 550 different species of moss and butterflies that can make their homes um, in this tree or their cocoons wrapped in the leaves or galls on leaves. Um, basically, um, it really supports all this tremendous diversity of, of wildlife um, through there. Uh, enough to support my birds now. And, you know, just talking about stacking functions or when elements perform multiple functions, the oak tree, you know, sheds old branches and twigs, which provides fodder, you know, because I can use in my fire pit because Stevie loves making fires. This chimney was donated, has a tray at the bottom so I can easily pull out the ashes and sprinkle them around as nutrients over the garden or in my compost heap. Well, they'll aid in fertility. You know, a lot of those, um, you know, trace elements, um, uh, magnesium and um, calcium, some other uh, are present in that wood ash, but um, you know, just know that you don't necessarily want to add a lot because they're alkaline and can raise the pH. So um, just seeing, you know, keep track of the balance. But for my vegetables, they're good at um, balancing out the fruit waste that I put in my compost. And so the branches and twigs can also be piled up as they make great, you know, bird perches or nesting sites, um, or aid in bee, um, make for um, bee habitat for cavity nesting bees. The birds perch on these, they flutter to the fence, to the trees, and just back and forth across the yards. Um, I have my branch pile off the ground using cement blocks or two by fours just to comply with the city codes and keep it off the ground. And then these two, uh, you know, logs 
these are actually oak logs. You know, I've used them to line the pass in the backyard because we had tours of 50 to 100 people. And so I wanted to avoid the compaction of our already heavy clay soils. They're mobile and adaptable. So if plants pop up in the pathway, I can also, you know, just move the logs around it. And they also provide those nesting sites for beetles and spiders and the cavity nesting bees and the tons of insects that live underneath. And so when I had to have some of the oak branches pruned out um, that were overhanging the house by an arborist, I found out that oak wood is a great substrate for shiitake mushrooms. And so I had them cut, the arborist cut them into sizes of these logs um, in the spring before the leaf, you know, as it'll help maintain, before the leaf, um, it leaves out in the spring as the bark has better integrity. And so usually outdoor logs are four to six feet long and would probably last longer, but I had the arborist cut them in smaller so that I could handle it myself and fit them in tubs so I could force fruit them in the summer if I wanted by dunking them in water. And so Stevie and I had dug holes and inoculated these with wooden pegs um, and then sealed the ho holes off with beeswax thanks to the honeybees in the backyard. And they, you know, the beeswax prevents the wooden pegs and mushroom mycelium from being infiltrated by other types of mushrooms and prevents the wooden pegs um, from drying out. And so it took 18 months before it <laughs> they popped out. But this summer I had tons, another bonus, they all cracks up. Um, little did I know this makes them a rare form of flower top shiitake mushrooms, um, you know, with an added value of $60 per pound and is formed when there are drastic temperature changes when they're uh, forming. So I don't have to do anything with these logs except harvest them. I also put in um, a red wine cap mushroom um, in the garden. This was part of my adaptation to climate change that I was observing in my own yard with the increased amount of rain and moisture and you know it's conducive for mushrooms and also because the maple leaf, um, the maple tree provided the chips um, from the branches that were taken out of there as substrates for the red wine caps. And, you know, there's things with mycelium and microbes are said to make connections of the plants under the soil. Um, you know, the honeybees have been feeding on some mycelium from certain mushrooms, so I think it helps build their immunity or that's what they're looking at. And so, you know, these are just silly things, but, you know, the black raspberries Two, um, really shifted my pruning management. I know in the Master Gardener program, you know, we're told the importance of pruning out diseased or weak canes, um, but I was surprised when I went to prune them out, um, it opened up and two birds nests that were in the red raspberries and one in the black raspberries were exposed and so they um, flew away and left the site. And so I've changed how I manage the canes on my own yard, shifting my pruning management and now leave most, if not many of those canes up. Um, because I don't mind, you know, what I thought would be sacrificing a little bit of yield, but if anything, you know, every um, single of the old canes I left up from last year have holes in them and I watched tiny little cavity nesting bees go in and out of these stems. And so, you know, single native bees use these to um, and close them up with mud or leaf, depending on what type of what they're collecting. Um, and so I really feel that um, you know, berries are self-pollinating, but just like one of the citizen science projects I participated in, uh, I think having the increased um, uh, pollinator access can uh, improve the harvest in amount and the qu quality as I saw in what we did with the sweet pepper um, I, uh... plants that were tested. Yes. I'm, break, I'm breaking in again. I'm sorry. Typically, we only have an hour for our presentations. Um, All righty. How, how far down the path are we? Are we close to the end? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I, can, um, I can stop here and answer any of the questions through here. Um, basically, I just kind of wanted to give an idea of things that you could do in your yard. Um, but I can stop here if you would like to go. I'm just going to flip through here to the end part. Um, well, I, I appreciate this. We really try, though, to respect the time. I get it. Committed with our audience. Mm -hmm. um, just to mention about this uh, free contour map creator, if you're wanting to look at um, the elevation in your property, you can, it's a free thing. So you can go there and just enter your address and put a couple markers on to outline your plot and it will give you 
um, the levels. And so that elevation, I did mine through all observation because I didn't find out about this tool, but it could be helpful. And so the swales of water, where to direct the swales were all kind of lined up parallel to these contours or followed, you know, they followed that contour. So they collected the water and then I dragged all of the um, swales across the yard so it would carry the water all the way across and make it more available to the plants that I wanted. And so again, just recycling everything in, um, you know, with the swales, the leaves, you know, Stevie and I had leaf corrals. And so basically um, you have free mulch there. Um, and then just turning, you know, the lawns into that crop rotation are some of the things that I've used in, uh, in the management, organic management, you can see without them. Um, and then even, you know, some of these really fun, funny organic gardening methods where I made these faux cabbage moth butterflies because they're territorial. And so basically, if the moth comes by, they think that um, someone's already there, so they don't lay their eggs. <laughs> and, um, I thought it would just be fun to try, just sort of as a joke, really. Um, but it was a fun activity to do with the kids. And I will definitely use this again because it was very clear to me that it did, it was working over what they were over. And so, you know, just diversity, keeping lights off because there's so much um, being said now that, you know, I know with our lamps or even solar powered that, you know, it can be for safety and security in our communities, but it really impacts, especially our moss or our um, nighttime pollinators who get confused and go to the lights and they've been showing a lot less uh, pollination when we have lights around. Um, and then I do have some things with our community that we expanded out. Um, you know, I had to come up with more, you know, garden snacks because I was competing with candy processed food. Uh, and so, you know, these were before, um, you know, but it's just for me, you know, we have this connecting corridor pollinator um, but, you know, I'm growing the native plants, Stevie building these um, to avoid the plastics. We made these uh, folded all of these partners who folded all of these paper pots from organic from recycled newspaper um, because the nursery industry is one of the biggest users of plastic. And so if we come back to these principles again, I'm. You know, if you don't grow an edible food forest, perhaps some of the more eco-friendly considerations can be incorporated. And I know I probably haven't left much time for questions, but if you want to maybe perhaps put them in the chat, I think I might be able to save that and I can see if I can try and send out responses to you then. And I hope to be out um, in Prescott in mid-November um, to join Stevie. So I hope maybe I can see maybe some of you either by distance or, um, you can let me know better what, you know, edible food forest plants grow out there. Um, you know, for me, it's really about grow what you like to eat, copy nature, increase the biodiversity, observe and make changes, use what you have, and just enjoy what comes and hoping you can enjoy in, um, in creating this food for yourselves and habitat for wildlife. Thank you. I'm sorry that I cut you off. We really... We really only, I think, had one question that didn't get answered because Stephen was in the background helping out here. Um, what was the website for the Contour Map Creator? If you just um, Google Contour Map Creator, it'll probably pop up. Um, okay. Yeah. And we had a, a comment I think you'd be interested in hearing. Um, let's, I'm trying to see who it was. Jane shared that the the... Hopi reservation town that you weren't able to pronounce they call yes. it K they call it K town K town okay yeah so um I want to thank everybody for hanging in there a little bit with us um I do want to let you know that um our last presentation is coming up for the year on November 16th it's going to be uh Burma composting the wonderful world of worms and I will be presenting on all that I've learned over the last year and a half uh, with all my worms. And I can tell you how you too could grow a lot of worms and be have, have some more permaculture in your yard, right? <laughs> anyway, thank you again and good night.
Good night. Thanks for allowing me to share, folks. Thank you for your time.